But first, election time, of course, means election promises. But what do New Zealanders need the most right now? We ask the key players in everything from poverty and business to women and climate change for their number one economic priority for the next three years. We see poverty uh, on a daily basis, homelessness, families struggling to put food on the table. A key way of doing this is to raise the family package and the core benefit rates. What are you going to do to create high paying, high value jobs uh, in sustainable industries? It's for the government to invest in jobs in areas where women work. So whether that's in health, whether it's in education, the community, whatever. What's going to be important for Māori is we need to use the opportunity through COVID-19 to push the big green reset button. And that means further investment for Māori jobs in the economy in our regions. We need to harness the power of digital technology, using our assets and Māori spectrum and all that sort of thing. Is enabling thriving cities and infrastructure, critically actually fixing our housing issues for all New Zealanders. Some different and better thinking around uh, small businesses and how to, how to grow them so that they become large businesses. As a regulatory framework that is sensible, practical and affordable that enables farmers to excel. Will you put a price on the greenhouse emissions coming out of the agricultural sector in the next term of Parliament and if not how can you possibly be serious about climate change? All right, joining me now are National and Labor's Finance spokespeople Paul Goldsmith and Grant Robertson. Ted Okora, thanks for coming. One of you next Saturday could have the power to make those economic priorities a reality. Uh, so let's just jump straight into it and we're going to talk tax first. OK, so Paul Goldsmith, your short term tax cuts, most of that's going to go to the top 25% of wage earners. Is that fair? It's absolutely targeted at middle income earners. Uh, the average full time worker gets about $64,000 a year. They'll get about $3,000 in the hand. And yep. if there's two of them, they get 6000 So we're targeting middle New Zealand, uh, the people who work hard and giving them some of their is own that, money. Back. Is that middle New Zealand is the question? Because if you take a median wage, it's $10,000 less. And Treasury says that $64,000 and above is the top 25% of earners. Yeah, the, the, the people who are working full time and we think that they need more money in their pockets and that stimulates the economy and get us back on track. We're, we're facing huge crisis as a country in terms of our economic uh, situation mm. and we want to put money back into the pockets of New Zealanders, uh, the people who work hard every day and that's what we're focused on. Are they really the forgotten middle, Grant Robertson? Well, I think the problem with the, the tax cut package that, that Paul's putting forward is it's completely unaffordable for New Zealand right now. Oh, nonsense. What we need to be able to do is invest in the public services that those all New Zealanders rely on in health and in education and and actually, doing things like lifting the minimum wage is likely to have more of a stimulatory effect because we know that people on low incomes spend the money that they get. So well, lifting the minimum wage would put $44 a week into yep. someone's pocket. Paul's plan would put $8 a week into that same person's pocket. Well, for, for, let's just deal with the, the forgotten middle first. Are you really just sort of bribing your voter base with this particular policy? I don't think you can bribe people with their own money. It's their own money that we're taking less of. And you know, the, con the country needs some stimulus. Uh, we're, we're looking at you know, maybe another 100,000 jobs to be lost over the next couple of years. Uh, the economy is shrinking. Uh, we th there are lots of different ways to do it. Uh, Grant and his team uh, want to have all these shovel-ready projects. Uh, we think the best way is to get money back directly into okay, the hands but, of New Zealand. But Zealand's the only asset. way you can afford those tax cuts, Paul, is by raiding the COVID fund, which is and the money we've left on the table if there is and we will talk about the COVID fund in a moment, uh, Grant Robertson. I want to ask you, though, what are you doing for anybody who earns more than the minimum wage? There's no stimulus there, is there? Nothing. Well, we've had, we've had significant investment through the wage subsidy scheme, which many of those people have benefited mm. from. But right now, Simon, the problem is we have still got a long way to run in COVID-19. And these kind of sugar hit policies that Paul's proposing mm. actually won't do the thing we need to do, which is build our economy so sustainably for in, a recovery and a rebuild. You're not in favour of short-term stimulus like this, are you? We've had the short-term... the minimum wage is not stimulus. Sure, the we, minimum wage is redeployed funds from other businesses. It's not new money into the economy. But the way that we stimulate the economy is in the investment we're making and helping to create jobs and supporting small businesses and making sure our exporters can keep trading that's the way we grow an economy sustainably. This kind of sugar hit politics from Paul isn't going to give New Zealand the economy we need to get through COVID. So I'm guessing that you would not be in favour of targeted cash grants that other economies have done 
Well, it's interesting no. you should say that, actually, because in the US, obviously, they did do that yeah. during this period of time. And actually, the research is now coming through that particularly the people who Paul's focused on, those in the, the, in the upper income bands, actually just kept the money. They didn't spend it. Yeah. They saved it. There's a very simple yeah. choice yeah, between the uh, uh, parties that want to put taxes up, uh, and there's a big debate about how far the Greens want to go. They've got wealth taxes. Yeah, and well, so not here who right knows now, about all yeah. that? Yep. So they want to put taxes up. Uh, we want to put money back into the hands of Kiwis. And we trust Kiwis to make the decisions. Do you, but you about don't have enough money, money to okay. do what you need to Can do. Can I just ask? Paul, a question, Grant, can I just ask Paul a question? Would targeted cash grants, which um, gave the same amount to everybody rather than tax cuts, would have been, have been a fairer approach? Well, look, the, uh, we think when people work hard uh, and the full-time workers earning around 64000 the doctors, that, uh, the, the nurses, the teachers, uh, we think those people are finding it tough and some extra money in their pocket will make a real difference to those families, and that's what we're focused on. All right, let's move on to small business, OK? So we are talking about the minimum wage, Grant Robertson. I've been talking to small business owners this week and they've said, look, they've had trouble clawing back the increases that they've already had to uh, absorb. They can't pass those costs on. So surely just delaying the next one in these COVID times is the responsible thing to do for small businesses. I've also been talking to small businesses right around New Zealand over the last few weeks. And, and what we know is that it is the minimum wage earners who spend their money in those small businesses. We flagged this increase as far back as the end of 2017. Yep. And, so there's, and the world has changed. Element of, yeah, no, <laughs> let me finish. The there's an element changed. of certainty here that people know that this is coming. They know that they'll be able to absorb it because that money gets spent again. And yet you've also, in your other policy, that they're worried about are extra five days sick leave and the extra public holiday, Matariki. Who pays for those? Yeah, obviously they've been brought in over time. So yeah. the Matariki one is coming in in 2022. The sick leave actually has a long-term payoff for New Zealand. If there's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us, it is that we do need to be careful about the way we manage public health. New Zealanders are pretty stoic. They go to work when they're not well. They actually make their colleagues unwell at the same time. This is what Australia already has, and I think COVID-19 has shown to us it'll be good for all of New well, Zealand that's, to and have that's that. a good point, isn't it? Australia already has 10 days sick leave, and that's, yeah. a, that's a cost that they, they, they Look, deal with. Look, what's That's what our small business should be able to cope with. Yeah, well, they're struggling right now, and this government has shown zero empathy for the needs of small That's businesses. Rapid. I was up and down uh, talking to the hospitality area, and one you know, woman who owns a cafe said to me, how on earth am I going to suddenly pay for twice as much sick leave? How am I going to put up the minimum wage? I can't... Uh, half of my costs are wages, and I'm struggling. A and this idea that the government can just keep on piling on costs at a time when businesses are struggling is unrealistic. And so, you know, what we, what we need is businesses that are actually sustainable and profitable. The small, yeah, but the small business sector in New Zealand, relatively speaking to the rest of the world, is actually doing pretty well at the moment. And it's because they are able to trade. Yeah. We have given them support through the wage subsidy scheme. We're extending out the small business cash flow loan scheme. We're providing support yeah. for people to go online. Look. So actually, our small business community is doing relatively well. Everyone in the world's doing it tough at the moment, but the balance of our policies means they're out there okay, trading. Quick, but quick reply. Well, uh, she's got to stop congratulating himself all the time. I'm not and congratulating myself. Recognise that, the whole of New Zealand. Recognising that New Zealand uh, is an isolated place. We should have done well in COVID, and oh. we have done well, and that's great, but we've got to focus on how we get out of what is a significant hole. OK, Look, all right. We're borrowing a billion dollars a week at the moment, and still we're going to be... So you would not many... do that, Paul? No, I'm just You'd saying stop we've got to recognise the scale of the economic challenge we've got, and this is not the time to be piling on additional costs, which might be nice in a boom time to businesses that well, are struggling let's, to let's employ talk, people. Let's, OK, let's talk about the whole, yeah. and not, not, we're not talking about the fiscal whole, we're talking about the whole in jobs, OK? So we're predicted to lose maybe up to 100,000 by February, February next year, uh, unemployment around 75 almost 8%. You want it back to 4%? We all would like to see it reduced down there. We've had it there at 4%. Look, at the moment, the Treasury's not projecting it getting back there in the next four-year period. And anyone who picks that number out and says, I can do that, has a crystal ball better than the rest of the world does. But the programs that we've got to help support companies to, to take people on, okay. to be able to move into the construction so sector so through state houses, I'm not giving you a 4% okay. target, but I can tell you we got it there. You got it there, but you don't, we, we don't have a time. It's a bit, no, no, at this point, and nobody can at the moment, all right. Simon. Paul Goldsmith? 
Elizabeth? 4%, yes. Yeah, well, we want to... And saying 2024? Well, what we want to see is New Zealand returning to the, the sort of job creation that we had under the previous government, where it was nearly 10,000 jobs a month Sure. Created. How often How is it? Okay. How often was it the last two years of the... Uh, last two no, years. it wasn't. Yeah, over You've the last two years. one quarter where it was 10,000. Over the last two years, out. there was a, a <laughs> real job creation in this So economy. how are you going to... If you're saying 10,000 is your... 10,000 a month yeah. is your goal, how are you going to create those? Well, the rest... Well, it's not the government that creates it. That's a big point of difference. We don't go and borrow money and buy jobs. Your policy it's about yeah. your policy it's creating an environment. The recipe hasn't changed. It's about keeping taxes low, about pushing back the tide of regulation that's overwhelming businesses so it makes it easier for firms okay. to hire. The, Being consistent around the rules and also allowing a bit of foreign investment into the problem, grow our the economy. Problem so it comes is the world has changed. Whether your recipe has changed or not doesn't actually matter. What it requires is a partnership between the government and the private sector, and COVID has proved that. So we're doing the immediate work with the Jobs for Nature programme, but yeah. we're also committing to building 8,000 new public houses. Right. to yep. investing heavily in yep. infrastructure, to supporting businesses to take people on through do our 50-wage Do you have a jobs scheme. target like that? I mean, do you have a, a figure that you'd like to be but creating? They throw figures everywhere. Well, hang on, they hang throw figures everywhere. Within hang each on. of those things we have, so for example, in Jobs for Nature, it's 11,000 jobs yeah. that we were looking mm. to create there. Within each of those, they will add up to that. But, uh, you know, we do need to grow the economy sustainably to get New Zealand through this and to recover and well, rebuild. That's, that's a the given. Everybody wants But the goal. government is yeah. an active partner in that. And yeah. if there's anything that COVID-19 proved is that we have to build on that partnership. Okay. It hasn't changed the rules of the universe in the sense you only stay in business if you give people what they want at the right price. And uh, that requires a competitive and productive economy. And we never yeah. hear anything from this government about that. It's all what? about government buying stuff, what going out, paying people okay. to shoot okay. possums, plant flex bushes so and things like that. I mean, you're, that's all good. You're accusing good. the government of buying jobs or creating jobs. Well, I'm just saying that's not He's the total answer. of creating yeah. jobs. What but a dreadful thing. No, so, Paul, I'm, I'm accusing you, you, you of know. just relying on government <laughs> only. And we trust Rubbish. Kiwis and the tens Rubbish. of thousands of businesses to actually create jobs, in August, not just government. In August, right. there were 9,000 more filled jobs in the New Zealand economy. We are actually doing relatively well. Yes, there are industries and sectors where we're going to have to work closely with them, and there's areas where we can grow new jobs, like agri-tech, like the digital well, sector. Yeah, destroying that jobs that requires the partnership scale. between government and the private sector, let's, not Paul's trickle-down theory. Let's talk about the people who have borne the brunt of unemployment so far. So in the June quarter, 11,000 jobs lost, 10,000 were women. So what can you do to address this in the next three years? Paul Goldsmith, what's in your plan for women? Well, you look, if women, when women were the first off uh, when jobs were lost, we've got to make sure that they're the first back on again yep. when jobs are created. How do you do uh, that? And that's not necessarily by putting on the end of a shovel uh, like this government. It's about uh, growing the economy, moment. stimulating the economy. Yep. And that's why, you know, one of the first things we do on the 1st of December is get that extra money into the economy. Then we back the tens of thousands of businesses up and down the country to take on that extra worker. And it's about doing those basics, not so overwhelming them with costs. And then, so w when, when the economy starts to expand, uh, the women okay, are the so first no, back off the But there's no target particular policy policy like, you know, saying uh, you know, some incentives for the kind of industries that women dominate. Well, there was no okay. incentive to take women out of the workforce, of course. You know, once, if they're the first out, we need to get them to be the first back in. And that's about growing the economy and getting the, okay. the economy uh, stimulated again. Grant Robertson, what are you going to do for the women that have lost their jobs? Yeah, well, we've got some very practical things at the beginning. So the, the changes we made around apprenticeship and trade training, mm. that's about the construction and infrastructure sector, where we actually do want to see more women in that sector. But in addition to that, it's also about mental health care, community care, aged care. All that training is now subsidised or free. Because in addition could, yeah. to that, what we've know, what we know from the work that we've done is our investment in health and in education, which Paul is going to be underfunding um, on his plan, Nonsense. actually oh. is also part Nonsense. of creating jobs. So, and, so, because one of the criticisms is that if you have the focus on shovel-ready projects, they are male-dominated industries, mm -hmm. and therefore women feel like you know, yes, certainly they should be given more opportunity there, but they're being left out as well. But a good example is the way we're going to change the flexi wage scheme, which is about um, encouraging employers to take people on who've been out of work. Part of that is ring-fencing it for people to start their own business. So we've got around 30 to $40 million but for that. Right. We know that women, but on, we know that, we know that women um, who have lost their jobs, particularly in the tourism and retail sector, where a lot mm. of this has come from, are interested in doing that. Also, we're supporting that tourism sector to rebuild as well. OK, so but um, that you've got the flexi-wage policy, which is uh, giving money to employers to take people on yeah. via MSD. And we've got job start. Got job start, which is, job start. Which is a similar kind of $10, thing. $10,000 for an employer. 
employer to take on an extra person. But you've got to remember, of course, a lot, many, many uh, women, young women in particular, have their own business. And, and, and it's about making it easier so that's to, why to we've survive. Them. Them. Well, but these guys just keep on piling on the costs and they just seem to live in this fairyland that you can keep on piling on costs and businesses stay Paul, afloat. Paul, the exactly. only okay. fairyland is one where trickle-down economics actually uh, works. Okay. It's about the government this being this an the 19th player. century. <laughs> well, the problem is it is for you. That's oh, the problem. Nonsense. Let us move on to COVID and the contingency. So let's, the, here's, here's the scenario, right? So the virus hits New Zealand a third time. So Labour, you set aside how much? 12 billion. 12 billion. How much have you set aside from COVID contingency? Well, we've got nine billion left because uh, we've got we got hang on, hang we on, do wait, we wait. do <laughs> so we've put we've taken four billion for the tax cuts yep. four and a half billion and and a little bit extra and then the rest of it the rest of the fourteen billion is available uh, five four billion over the next two years we may well be using uh, the rest of it is uh, is there and available if we so, need. So, okay, Paul, so I've got your fiscal plan here. You've got four billion. You're spending it on the tax cut. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're spending the four doing. billion on the tax cut. Yeah, the rest of it's available. Hang, hang on. So you're spending four just billion. as available as it is for you. So four billion on the tax cuts from yeah. the original. The whole point years. of the, tax, the the COVID fund was to to deal with the the economic consequences <laughs> of COVID, and the, yeah. one of the best ways we can do that is to stimulate the economy. Okay. It, so uh, if if you got say, I mean. Uh, What's the figure again? Just to remind me, how much have you got? There's nine billion still left. Nine billion is okay. okay. So, will if COVID hits a third time, would you consider another wage subsidy? Well, you would have to consider it, but it is the very, very last uh, lever would want to pull is having another lockdown. The country cannot afford further lockdowns, and that's why it's critical you have an effective border policy. Okay, and, you and do everything you, you possibly can to avoid it. But you if you tight, did, but yeah, then would you then, tighten the rules up of the rules? wage subsidy? Uh, yeah, well, we would certainly look at the rules. It, one of the great surprises to us was the first uh, wage subsidy was loose as a goose. The second one, four, four weeks later, four months later, hadn't really changed. And I think you do need to think carefully about the, the uh, boundaries so to Judith, make sure that people... Judith Collins says she'd like to recover some of that from businesses that are now reporting dividends. Yeah, well, I mean, that would be the last resort. What you want to do oh, is... is so, uh, so you what can't do that? Small change well, of plan there, Paul. Yeah, that's possible. But the, the best mechanism is uh, sunlight and uh, maximum so public like, pressure. So you're walking back from the, the yeah. leader's comments on that? Well, no. The, the, the leader said, uh, and quite rightly, that New Zealanders are very upset at the prospect of uh, mm. companies having taken a wage subsidy and turning out to still be very profitable okay, so and Robinson. laying off workers. Uh, and, and so you've yep. got to have some response. The okay, best so response is to hold them to account publicly which, and then... Okay, they'll it's work. what we've been doing all the way through. Sure. We've, had, we've had a team of auditors working on this mm. and we've seen nearly half a billion dollars paid okay. back. Mm. All right. The point I would make is that Paul is not leaving himself enough money in this plan either to deal with a COVID resurgence or to pay for our health and education system. Mm. Actually, the money he's using for his tax cuts comes from that COVID fund. Yeah. So if there is a resurgence, yeah, National still does not have it's the money they need. It's but irresponsible. You, you, ah, but, okay, irresponsible. You're, you're differing on we've the got the yeah. money here on the table <laughs> because we've had a plan and we've stuck okay, the first uh, thing is hang on, stop Paul, hang on, waste hang on, uh, hang, uh, that's available. Hang on, Paul, I just didn't finish on that. The last, last question on this. If you've got companies like this week, we've seen Warehouse and other companies reporting profits and they've done that because because the wage subsidy has been there, should you be clawing that back? No, because we made an agreement with them and it's really important for the government to stick to its word and provide certainty. Okay. If they met the criteria, then they are eligible for the funding. If they then choose to return it because things are looking better for them out in the future, that's a okay. good thing. All right, I want to move on to just two quick more questions. We're running out of time. We've been talking lots. COVID is creating winners and losers, isn't it? OK, so you've got people who are you know, for both of sure. your sets of policies. How are, you going to create, how are you going to fix this gap? And the gap is house owners reduce mortgages, OK? Tax cuts for people who are, who are earning and house prices are going up because of cheap interest. Uh, so how are you going to address that inequality that this is creating? I mean, it is important at the outset to, to remember that, you know, for many New Zealanders, the house is their big asset and they want to feel confident about that. So it is important that we don't do things to undermine that confidence. But actually dealing with the housing market fundamentally comes down to making sure we build more houses, to making sure that we actually provide opportunities for people to buy their own home through so things like progressive home ownership. Things like Kiwi Build. Yeah, and Kiwi Build's part of a bigger plan pool. We've built more houses since any government since the 1970s. Okay. And so we're going to have to continue doing that. Plus, we've got things like the Bright Line test, which means that if you do sell a house other than your family home within five years, yeah. you pay tax on that. Paul right. wants to bring that down to two yeah. years yes, he does. to encourage speculation. So, so, um, so this government's all about build back better. Well, the only building that we know is a Kiwi build, which has been a total and, and un so how would you, how would you 5,000 5, state houses. Total fiasco. How would you address this growing inequality between the asset rich and those... Well, well, the best thing you can do, of course, is focus on reducing the cost 
cost of producing new houses and increase the supply. Yep. And that's about regulatory reform particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, the RMA... Uh, yeah, the nine years and 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 both and Labor thing. never, nine ever supported and any change to the RMA. And you both are going to do stuff about the RMA now, so let's just move Well, on yeah, but that. they'll make it worse. Oh, <laughs> come on. We'll, we'll actually Last improve question. it. We've actually done a review and gentlemen, we've got a plan. You had nine years and you did nothing. Right. Right. And you've got a plan I to make it worse. One That's the point. Last question for you both, OK? You've both been criticised as being a bit too centrist. Uh, you came into, into power saying transformation, transformation, transformation. One idea that is transformative, not centrist. Oh, there's a huge number of them, but it is the move to 100% well, renewable. Hang on. It is the move to 100% <laughs> renewable electricity, which helps drive oh. things like the hydrogen economy, mm. which is a really important part of our future exports, as well as being good for the environment. Okay, Paul goes with one radical, transformative idea to help us in the next three years. Well, trust in New Zealanders, a and we trust them to to build the businesses and employ the people and get New Zealand back on track. We've got to stop the waste, got to stimulate okay. the economy with some tax cuts, and then we trust Kiwis no. uh, to, to, you, to know how to spend. Does their not money add up, Paul. and grow Your their economy. Does not add up. These and, guys and, think and the government knows best up, on every topic. The government knows best. All right, and I am going to leave it there. Thank you so much for a spirited debate. Grant Robertson, Paul Gosworth, really Thank enjoyed you. it. If you've got something to say about what you see on our show, please let us know. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, News Up Nation NZ. Twitter panel this morning, business commentator Tim McCready and NZ Initiative Chief Economist Eric Crampton using the hashtag NationNZ. Or you can email us the old-fashioned way, nationandmediaworks.co.nz. Still to come, FIA can...